the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Let me just review what we had done the first quickly, the first lecture. I want to see what uh, you gathered out of it. If I ask you that God instituted marriage, and I ask you how did God do it, what would you say? From what we had studied in Genesis 2. How did God proceed to do this project? Give me a couple of words. You know, don't tell me everything we talked about, but just a couple of words that would kind of uh, highlight what God had done. How did he do this project? Was it... Let me ask a question. Uh, was it uh, a one-step project? Was it multiple steps? Did he do it? How did he do it? It's a process. He did a process to reach to the final... So what was the final step? Perfection. No, he didn't do the perfection. So, so he, he, he ended up with... We, we end Genesis 2 with the creation of... Not man. But woman. <laughs> but uh, the people, the evolutionists would say woman is the evolution of man. But he ended up with creating Eve. But before that, immediately what happened? Yes. And he led him in love, in that yearning, to give up or to surrender his body. To surrender his body. When Adam was ready to give his body for God to take a to rip, God, but Adam felt something before that. And that was the step leading up to that. He felt the loneliness, he felt the longing that he is not, it's not good to be alone. Good. Uh, what is God's purpose? Remember what's God's purpose? Unity. This is going to be the end of chapter 17 in John. The last thing Jesus would say before he goes to the cross, so that we all be one, like I and you, Father, are one. This is the goal that God is seeking, that the image of God in, 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 in his multiplicity and unity would be perfected in marriage. And that's what we need to talk about today as the, the continuation of this. So we talked about the human expectations, and then we talked about Genesis 2, and we talked about the divine project that love permeated the whole process, and love and offering up oneself. Uh, we talked about unity, complementation, and procreation to bring more to fill the earth. That's one of the jobs that the humans had to do, to uh, procreate. And then we talked about finding unity on the uh, superficial or deep, replication or complementation, and then general denominators, and I remember Joey asking the question, this is human logic, where is God's work? And we said, when we are really into God's life, you don't need that. It's only when we are clouded by emotions or confused. And I have a lot of questions from singles who come after knowing somebody. Uh, you, you, you have this question, Abuna, I have uh, this nice person, this is nice, a nice man, nice girl, I, I think everything is about her good, but, and the question is about the buts, the, the, the exceptions. Okay, so that they usually are one of these. And then uh, we said that Christ himself said they are one flesh. And then anything that goes against that oneness is a sin. Because that's the goal of the human, of the divine project. Uh, the human project says, what, what is in it for me? I'm not fulfilled. I'm not happy. I don't get what I want. On different levels. Um, one more thing I want to say about this. I think I cannot get done with this. This is actually the biggest struggle. It is where we leave our selfishness and begin to think of others. That's the true love. When we will reward, you know, uh, any child, little baby, you can ask for the mothers. They're very self-centered. They, they tell you. They even think the mother is part of them. The human, the, the, the child psychologist would say this to you when they do study development. When the baby is crying for food or hungry or dirty, wants to be clean, and the mother is late, in his mind, is cursing his mother. Where is this, that, that, that woman? <laughs> 
But when he, when she is feeding and nursing and cleaning, he is smiling and blessing. He say that. But then after all, he discovered after few traumas that his mother is not there all the time. He was a noon. You know, he was a noon. He didn't need to cry or say anything. But then when he comes out, he is in need of everything. So this takes too long. We say to you that the human child is the most dependent creature of all God's creation. You know, deer, gazelle, camels, dogs, cats, when they're born, a few minutes later, they're on their feet, taking care of themselves. It's only the child that takes two years. Birds, maybe. I have this very nice image of, uh, of uh, a mother bird feeding the little ones and all because I like to look at it. We're like that with God. But the human being takes that for two years. For two years, the child is very dependent. But in that process, he thinks the whole world will revolve around them. They are very self centered So the, the perfection of a human being is to go, to start there, and then to go through a process until you are selfless, giving, thinking totally not of yourself. It takes our work from God and from everybody. It, it goes through a process. One of the best examples I have is Abraham. So, let me just tell you this. How can Abraham reach to the degree that he can offer his son? How can do that, that happen? He started by a child, a child taking care of. Love to Abraham is receiving. I only love from the receiving, receiving end. But then he goes to marry Sarah. And we know how much Abraham loved Sarah. He even listens to her. Even. But then, when that, when that is perfect. So first love is I receive. A child receives. And he's not obliged to give anything. A father or mother would say, I'll give you the love. All what you need to do is not to reject me, not to say no. But then you get into a marriage. How is love experienced? It is reciprocal. I give you, but I also expect to receive. To be loved and to, to love. That's what we call in love. But then as you move on to be a parent, what happens? Exactly. <laughs> Not only your hair, everything of you is being taken out. It takes a lot from the parent. And they do, you know, as a parent, you don't want them to love you, even. Right? If that's what, when you are really caring about your kids, you want them to be okay, to be good. You don't care if they say, I love you, mama, I love you, papa, it doesn't matter. All what you care about, that they are actually well taken care of. That is when you are experiencing selfless love. So you move through this schooling from being taken care of to take care and being taken care of. Then eventually you are made ready to move to taking care of. This is a process to completely dissolve your I, the ego, and to try and accept the other as your new identity. That's a tough process. And this is what we talk about as an imperfect and in perfection when we are ready to move on to the selfless giving. Then the family is the image of God, actually. Because in that image, we see the perfect image, the perfect example of the family. Uh, first of all, it is in the book of Genesis that we read, let us make man in our image. This is a language of, the article here is, plural in our image according to our likeness, but then let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the earth, over the cattle over the earth, all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So it is an image of plural, and the likeness of, and the image of it is an image of also plural. This is extremely important. In the Jewish, in the Hebrew language, there is no glorification language. You don't speak in the magnification like the kings. We, the King of England, or we, the President of the United States, I hope you don't do that. So, this means that God is a plural, making a man in plural, and there's a lot implied in that. A lot implied. I'll tell you why. In our creed, from the Gospel, from the Revelation of the Trinity, we know 
What do you say? We believe in one God. God the Father, creator of everything. And then you say, we believe in one Lord, His only begotten Son, born of the Father before all ages, true God of true God. Then the Father is the origin, and the Son is His Son. He comes from Him. And what do you say about the Spirit? We believe, yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the one that proceeds from. So you have the Father. And by the way, the, the, the origin of the word Father means, anybody knows? Linguistically, in Hebrew and Aramaic, both, it means origin, source. So when you say Father, He is the source of the Son, He is the source of the Spirit. Guess what? In the creation of Adam, God could have done. Uh, Eve from the ground again. Well, what did God do? He didn't do that. What did He do? He took the new human being from the substance of Adam. When Adam actually woke up, he said, She is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She's essentially part of me. When a child is being born, it's born out of the couple, what does that mean? That is an image of God. You have a father, son, Holy Spirit, the origin is one. And the man, the same thing, he has a wife and child that's coming up. So you discover something very important. I'm sometimes surprised. Why don't we talk about man, a human family, as an image of God, which is the first talking about the image. When you want to have an example, you go to the sun, and you go to the uh, light and fire and all that stuff, but you ignore the most important one that God himself said. God is a family in unity, and his image is, the image of God is a family in unity. So the family is the image of God. You go from any angle you're going to see it, that's exactly it. But how does that family function? Let's look at that. What does Jesus say about his father? When he spoke about his father, he says the father has given a lot to the son, too much to the son, what did he say he gave? Hmm? He gave everything. All his substance is poured into his son. He didn't keep anything. The, they say the fathers of the church, the only difference between the father and the son is one word. You know what it is? The only one word that differentiates the Father from the Son, begotten, unbegotten. The Father is not begotten. He was never born. He's the origin. But the Son is. He's born of the Father for all ages. That's what we said. The difference between the Spirit and the Father and the Son is that the Spirit proceeds. Don't ask me what's the difference between procession and birth, because I don't know. It's difficult theological stuff. But what you notice here that everything the Father is, is given to the Son. Every good thing the Father and the Son is given to the Spirit. The same way, everything that Adam is, is given to Eve. Dignity, flesh, bone, mind, respect, honor, everything. And everything they both have is given to their children. No human being give birth to a monkey, unless you are an evolutionist in the reverse. But some people will say, my, my child is a monkey. But that's not the case. Okay, so we have here an image of God in a human family. And again, God is three, but the one is incomplete because there is nothing that actually they are missing. They, everything we have, they are not sharing. By the way, the theologians say they don't share things. There is no line they can say the father stops here, here starts the son. The, the son and the father start, start, stops here, here starts the spirit. Nothing like that. Everything, everything the Father has goes to the Spirit. Everything that the Father has goes to the Son. Everything the Son has goes to the Father. We saw this in Jesus' life. He said, He gave His body on the cross. He gave His blood. He gives, uh, gives, uh, gives Him His life. He said, I don't even speak things at, at mine. I speak what the Father told me to speak. Eventually, He gives Him His Spirit. He said, unto your hands I commit my Spirit. So everything is given. This is the attitude that we should have in the family. So I have said when somebody thinks alone and they say, what am I getting from this marriage? Or he is treating me not, not nice. How should a husband or wife think? 
when they are not being treated nice by the other spouse. In lieu and vision of this, of this image. Let's say that a husband has come very tired from work and he's angry and he's venting anger on the wife. What she should think if she is in the perfect image of God. Absorb his anger. And how would she think and what feels in her heart? She would be worried that he is... No, that he is in trouble. There's something bothering him. It is now her own problem. Because she doesn't think he and I. It is we are in trouble. Maybe he's not expressing himself right. But she thinks he is in trouble. When he comes home and she is very stressed and she had not done anything that, you know, that's pleasing, and then what would he think or should think? Say, she may be tired today. Maybe she needs time off. Maybe she had a hard time with the kids. Maybe, 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 it doesn't matter. But what, it, what matters the most, I need to take care of her. But might happen, you say, I got enough hard time, I, I, I had enough trouble at work, I don't need this, let me get out. That's usually what happens with husbands. Let me out of here. Find some, some other place to go to. What is that going to do? This is not the image. This is something else. So how do you maintain that unity? How do you get in this image and continue in this image? Definitely, first of all, you have to communicate with God. If He is the source of this project and He is the maintainer of it, I need to have my prayer life. And I have to have communion. Why communion especially? Why communion? It's very important in married life that you have to keep. It is union with Christ, but also there's something else. It is like we take the life of Christ, but there's something about communion that actually St. Paul pointed out very uh, poignantly. He's very clever in making these remarks. So I say prayer life, communion, communication, and forgiveness. Those are the four things that we need to uh, keep in mind when you want to maintain that unity as an image of the Trinity. Let me just read with you communion. And the letter to the Corinthians. St. Paul specifically said this, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. <clears throat> I speak as wise men, judge for yourself, so they say, The cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread we break is not the communion of the body of Christ. For we, though many, are one bread and one body, for we all partake of that one bread. The source of our unity as a church, the source of unity of the family is communion. He specifically said that. So after you are very keen on keeping your prayer life alive, you have to address communion. This is one of the biggest sources of our unity. I personally, my first job is to keep you in communion. That's my first job. To seek out and find out who is not in communion because I want everybody to share in this one prayer. Because we cannot be maintained as the body of Christ without that one bread and the one cup. One of the things that would hurt your marriage if you keep away from communion for no good reason. Be extremely careful that this does not happen. Now we come to communication. That's a big topic. The goals of communication there's another topic about communication we call it nakedness. And there's appropriateness. It seems like conflicting, but they're not. And the last one is first of all. So let's talk about communication. In the account of the Genesis, actually it ends up with a very interesting description. And the man and the woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. There were three three persons in that garden. It was the man, the woman, in Christ. Men, the woman in Christ. And they were okay to be naked. Why is that? Everything written in that account has a meaning and it's so deep and it's important for marriage, for the church, for everybody. 
As a church, we have to be naked in the church. I'm not naked physically. What does that mean? Honesty, clearance, nothing to hide. We're all in the light. I'm not keeping something back. I'm not walking in and saying, you know, I wish that they don't know about this about me. I am, I am going to keep this. I'm not going to tell them any, anything. In the paradise, there was nothing to hide. They were not ashamed of anything. And what Christ had done after the sin is that he covered our shame. So I'm not, I don't have to be ashamed. So this is extremely important in the talk about communication, that nakedness has to come in. But we have to talk about appropriateness too. So let's talk about communication for a little bit. When we talk about communication, I think in marriage and also in the church, we have to have an open dialogue. One of the things that happens in marriage is a lot, and I hear about it in confessions and marital problems is, Abuna is usually a, a, the, the, the woman, the, the wife. She says, Abuna, he wants my relationship. I don't want it. I don't feel like it. And sometimes we are in conflict, and he comes demanding it. It usually happens that way. Very rarely the opposite. And if you ask the wife, she would say, there has to be some um, dialogue. I need to kind of feel that I'm connected. If that connection doesn't happen, the physical intimacy to me is taking advantage. You're taking advantage of me. I'm becoming to you a dead body. So communication has two parts. Listen to this. There's a part that's verbal, and there's a part that is non-verbal. Which more is more, which more, more effective and more fulfilling? Usually the non-verbal. But you cannot reach the non-verbal without the verbal. You have to start with the talk. You have to start with communicating on the verbal level. Even in God's world, in the kingdom of heaven, you come and make a prayer. You come and confess. You make a praise, you sing, and eventually at the end of the liturgy what we do, we take communion. That is the non-verbal. So it's extremely important that we communicate and keep that communication going by all means. Whatever cost it is, men and women has to open up in marriage. The best time they tell me, uh, you know, that's what I understand. Best time to communicate with your kids when you're riding it with them in a car when they're looking straight or aside and you're not looking at their eyes. The best time, they tell me, it is in bed at night. When everything is done and said the kids are asleep, everybody's done their jobs, when you are about to sleep, I think it's extremely important that the wife at least talks and tells what she needs to say. And the husband has the heart and the ears to listen. I'll tell you what, in my mind, goes Eve to fall. What did cause Eve to fall? Think about it for communication sake. From that aspect. Exactly. The communication was a side communication. And I, I, I'm sure Adam was there. I'm 100% sure because they didn't leave each other. And he said, okay, she's talking to the servant. At least she would. <laughs> yes, to, to, get, to get busy so she doesn't have to say, it's not to me, I don't have to do anything. Big mistake. What happened? He got in trouble. <laughs> he didn't think he would get in trouble. He got in trouble. That is important. If you read the men from Mars and women from Venus, one of the messages they give in this book, which is a good one, I think it's a, it has a very Christian uh, aspect to it, that women communicate verbally uh, and they need it. They need that. And it's very important that men listen. If they don't listen, we they lose them. If the man doesn't listen to the wife, they don't lose them. And what it means to listen. This is extremely important that we stop and talk about how to do empathic listening. What's that? Listen with empathy. How do you listen? It makes a big difference. Focus. Give me, yes, focus. 
voice. How do you give me that? Uh, give me that image of a listening, a big listener in communication. Your eyes is you make an eye contact, but then <laughs> some has to make an eye contact, but they're not there. <laughs> they look at the eyes, and you can feel like they are drunk. <laughs> have this glazed eye. Look. That, this exact. There is facial expressions that means I'm with you. There is also a response. I need to clarify this. One of the best things you can do with empathic listening, even with your kids, is to summarize what they said. To repeat what they said and to get to the point. Like say, for example, uh, uh, she's talking about something happened at work with her or something happened in school. They say, I guess I get a feeling that you're angry. You were angry about this. Yes, I was angry. So you actually did say that I not just understood what you said, I co they I validate your feelings, I quote your feelings, I captured your feelings. Sometimes that makes a big difference when the person is talking. Because it says you don't just listen to them, you understand them. And that makes a big difference. But if, if the husband keeps saying mm, mm, and the and artist goes, mm, okay, mm. Okay, are you with me? Yes, 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 get done with it. This is extreme. So in communication, you're going to say this, and I hope that we get it. It's really very important. Once you pass that test of communication, your rest of the job is not a big deal. But, that's the, the but again. Communication is a fact. One of the worst times you can communicate with your husband when he right, comes from work. Listen to me, I have a thing to say today, I have a report when he's just coming out of the door. That we talk about time and timing. The pipe time. is broken, the kids have gone crazy. Yes, crazy. yes. <laughs> and they're, they're exactly. And light is not working. That's usually for the husband a big test. Because the, the first thing that comes to mind, I don't need this, I'm out. Or I feel usually hungry, yes, hungry, tired, to have problems of his own, he needs to talk about. One, one thing about the husband too, and, and this, is if they don't think unity, if the couple doesn't think unity, if they think on the level of normal human beings, they say, I'm not going to talk to you about my problems, you know, you're my wife, I should take care of you, that's the man thing. I'm never going to talk to you about my human. So you're taking advantage of me being silent, and you're going to abuse me and you'll be like my boss at work. But the timing is extremely important. And the time, so the time has to be enough. The time has to be enough. It is enough, how do I know as a man or a, or a, or a husband or a mother or a wife that I've got enough communication? How do you know? There is sometimes some, some wives, and I see this with me even in compression when they call upon the phone, they, they catch you and they just said that my love. They just, they're not going to let go. They're not going to let go. So how do you know they got enough? When you respond to them, you There's certain signs. You care about what they say. Yeah, you care about what they say and they move on from one topic to another or keep repeating the same thing. They say it 16 times, 17 times. How do you know they got enough? When the things are repeated, I know that. When their tone of speaking is calmer, and their feelings are a little bit more comfortable. You know that they had enough. Then you can actually do an aggressive enough. So I can we keep the rest of it till tomorrow? Believe me, trust me, there will be no tomorrow for this again. It's done. But they had enough. Okay? So this is extremely good. The time is important that how much time you get, it depends on how much energy they have, they need to vent. Words and communication vents energy. The event anger, the event depression, the event anxiety, the event something. If I don't listen, one uh, verse from St. James, letter, what did he say? Be quick to listen. Be quick to, be, be quick, to, I'm sorry, be quick to listen. Slow to talk, slow to anger. Quick to listen, slow to talk. So don't jump into talking. Uh, you know, uh, well, even Ben showed me this video here, which I think I showed it to some of you. The, it's not about the nail clip. Yeah. You've seen it? I saw it. 
It's a, like three minutes clip from the YouTube. The woman has a nail stuck in her head, right? And she's talking to her husband and saying, I have this achy, headachy feeling. I don't know what to do with it. And the men say, I know how to fix it. <laughs> no, stop. You're not going to fix anything. I'm telling you about mother I feel. You're quick to say, fix it. She wants him to listen. <laughs> so, okay, I'm listening. I am listening. And then he's looking at it like he's just on edge. She wants to <laughs> But then, eventually, and they, they get a little bit passionate, they want to kiss her, and then he bumps into the nail, she screams, Let me take the nail, she says, You're going again, stop! <laughs> anyway, so this, uh, this has to be uh, in the right time. Approach it, tactfulness. Sometimes our problem with each other is each other. Like, I'm really hurt over and over again about what somebody's doing. I'll give you an example, what I mean by approach and tactfulness. Uh, one day in the, in the clinic, I said this story before maybe, one day in the clinic, one uh, nurse, we had, we closed the clinic at 5, and the person comes at 5, goes to the emergency room, and they pay a lot of money if they don't have insurance. Maybe 10 times what they pay in the clinic. So this person comes 10 minutes before 5, and I said, can we take this patient? And the nurse went berserk. Can't do this, this is not right, you're absolutely off, off uh, line, you're, you're, uh, you're, uh, you're, you're, you have no right to ask me to stay up over time. I said, just go quite, quite, quite. Okay. You want to go home? Go home. I'm going to take care of him. Take care of his blood pressure and vitals and everything. And then she said, and she left angrily. Next day, she apologized. Said, I'm sorry. Yesterday was our uh, wedding anniversary. And my husband expected me to be home, prepared and ready. I said, it would have been better that you said, I need to go because I have an anniversary. But you thought in your mind that's none of his business, he has no right to do this. So this is not tactful. The approach is very untactful. What I think the, 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 what is the word, the rule that I want to take from this is, and instead of going to the husband or wife and say, you should, what you're doing is not right, I should say, I need this. Can you help me? It will help a lot in the other's perspective. That humility. That you come from a perspective of need rather than forcing rules. You're not, I mean, the answer would be, you're not my teacher, I'm not your student. Don't treat me that way. You're, you're treating me with the shoulds and shouldn't. Who can have that say? You're my wife or your hus my husband. He shouldn't say should or shouldn't. You should say, I need. What do you need? I'll be your servant. If you tell me I need you, I'll be at your feet. But you tell me you should and shouldn't, I'm going to retaliate, I'm going to defend. So this way of approaching, when I need to communicate something I'm not happy about, is better communicated on the level of I need, rather than you should or you shouldn't. This is an extremely important, even with kids, even with you, you can teach them to be humble, like, uh, honey, I need you to be more organized because it would help me a lot. Can you help mama? Can you help baba? I need you to wake up early so we can go to church and be on time. When the person hears that, you get them excited. They want to help you. They want to be active. But should and shouldn't make them feel that they're not doing their job, put them down, make them feel better about themselves. And every time you talk to them, they're waiting for a judgment. So this is extremely important in communication. So you communicate uh, in a, at enough time, you know the time from, how do you know that this is enough time? This is an extremely important topic and that's why I wanted you to get your feedback. How do you know that you have enough time to communicate? Yes, sir? When they start to calm down. When they calm down, what else? If they keep repeating the things, you know, one of the things I know from repeating things, it is not my issue. I'm not going to resolve it. Do you get what I'm saying? They have somebody else that they have to deal with, but they don't know what to do with it, so they actually... But every time they tell me the story, they get nowhere, so they repeat it again. They think when they do it again, it's going to help them to feel better. So they do it over and over. <laughs> so I said, maybe it is so and so that you need to talk to them. I've experienced this a lot. With myself and with others. I'm, I'm first. I, uh, the other day, 
were talking with another priest, and we had to go to a funeral. He refused totally to go to the funeral. funeral. And I was begging him to go because it would not look good. Um, and then what happened is the family of the deceased person uh, told him not to come. So I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him, and I begged him. And I, I, well, after like 15 minutes of begging, because it was not good, I realized it's not my problem. Well, what am I doing? So I called the family, and the family apologized, and they got him to. That's the way. So sometimes when people repeat over and over again, you have to stop. And this communication, this is not a fruitful communication. You have to stop. Okay? Uh, the nakedness is about openness. As much as we can, we open. And this happens in marriage gradually, and you have to maintain it. Uh, time and timing is so enough time, and the timing has to be appropriate. Approach and tactfulness, humility is very much needed here in communication. What can I do to help you? I need courage to forget. To forget. This is an issue with the counting. Yes.
what Christ is saying here, what is he saying? If he's your brother, it is okay to be a doormat. I mean, you don't even think about it. Don't think about it even this way. You're bearing with him, you're serving him, you are loving, you're caring. It doesn't matter. Don't keep counts. In marriages, we should never keep counts. Never. Yes, but then it's St. Paul who said, I can go around with a sister wife. He called his wife a wife, a sister. Because she's sister in Christ. In the church, she's a sister. Let's go and talk about this in the way Jesus said. Let me just, he said, to give you a picture about the kingdom of God. What it feels like. What is the kingdom of God? If God is your king, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, if you are really active, live member of the body of Christ, that's how you see it. Therefore, he said, the kingdom of heaven, if God is your king, and you are active in that kingdom, is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 pounds. He said, everybody's borrowing from the royal uh, treasury. Let's get them back and see what they owe to the treasury. But as he was not able to pay this servant, his master, the king, commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made out of his selling as a slave. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And then the master of that servant was moved with compassion. The good king released him and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet like he did with the king and begged him saying have patience with me and I will pay you all he said the same thing exactly but he would not but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt so when his fellow servants saw what had been done they were very grieved and came and told their master all that he had been done then his master after he had called him said to him you wicked servant he called him wicked now I forgive you all that did because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant, just like I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered angry. This is anger's God. And delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that he was due to him. So my heavenly father, that's Christ, my, that's Christ, heavenly father, also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespass. This is very uh, graphic. What does that say? So to forgive, this is all I think I get from this. What, who is the king? Jesus says. The father. And who is the servant? The first one. That's me. And who is the other servant? The person who hurts my feeling, or grieve me, or insult me, and who are the tormentors? That's very important. Who are the tormentors? That's a good question. You know what the tormentors are? Hmm? It's the depression, the anxiety, the lack of sleep, the troubles in life, all these things that would not make our life easy will be very troubled because God is in control. He's a pantocrator. So he's controlling our life and he's protecting us from all that stuff. So you don't act nicely with your brothers. He's going to let one of those sums, just one, and all of them will, broke, will break loose. So what I see in this, so how did he forgive me? How did the Father forgive me? And what, what did he have to do to forgive me? The cross. The, the gift of his son. He sent Jesus so he can die for me. So what I do for myself, I get my, my friends or my brother, my sister, my people in the church to insult me. What do I need to do? I, this is a practical thing. You get a cross or an icon of the cross and look at it. And keep saying to the Father, what? You forgave me 
and that's how much you gave and how much you lost. Cannot I forgive somebody who did that little to me? How, what can I pay God back for what I have done that, that led to the death of his son while others are doing things that really doesn't lead that way? So the comparison is not fair. Actually, in the, one of the other Gospels, says 500, 500 thousands and 50. It's like a big, big amount of money. So forgiveness is extremely important to maintain unity. You want to forgive. There's four levels of forgiveness, just to tell you this. The easiest way, the easiest way, or the most direct, you know that GPS has easy route, direct route, maximize three ways, the fastest. Huh? The fastest. The fastest. Right. The fastest way is to forgive without having apology. You know, forgiveness is a free gift. You can forgive, you don't need to have anybody apologize. That's the easiest and the fastest. But if you can't, what would you do? Jesus has given a prescription. I want us all to remember that prescription. He says, Yes? Go talk to him, and he said the condition in talking to the person and, and rebuke him between you and him has to be, well, there's a condition. Privately. Why? Why do you have to rebuke privately? With husband and wife, it has to be in the bedroom. Not even the kids. Don't ever get the kids involved. Never. They have to be out of it. Totally. Once you bring in the kids, they become your parents. They will give you advices, and they will be your parental counselors, <laughs> but not people. As young as five years old, they will tell you what to do and what not to do. It will not be good, and you will lose your authority. <clears throat> so, privately, you go and, and talk to the, your wife or husband. What, what, what would you say, and how would you do it? Very kindly. Honey, <clears throat> I was a little bit hurt about what happened. And, and sometimes the best way to do it, the best way to do it, from my experience with a friend, I tell them, you know what, I don't want you to say anything. Let me just vent what I feel, and I want you to listen. If you listen, that's all they need. Then you have acknowledged my pain, and that's all they want. What if the husband doesn't listen, or the wife doesn't listen? What do you do? You need to bring someone who you're going to have to be very, very careful when bringing that other person. Usually you should bring someone, and so the choices are very, very limited. If you bring your father or your mother, it will be her in-laws. If you bring her parents, it will be your in-laws. If you have someone from the both parties that you both agree and respect, good. I'd say, I will jump to the third one, you have to bring Abuna, but Abuna will come not as a judge. In that case, Abuna will come as a friend. I would never, never be a judge, try as much as I can, avoid that be judge, because the third part is to have Abuna as a judge, or to go to a bishop. So the first one is you talk privately. You for, the first one is you forget, right? The second one is, is talk, talk privately to acknowledge your pain. And it's the best thing you can do it with minimum, minimum judging. More pointing of view. The third one is you bring someone that actually can be a mediator, that as a friend. And the third and the last one or the fourth one would be judge. We're going now for serious matters. Very serious stuff. Now, when Jesus said this, he said when they don't listen to the church, let him be to you as the the Pharisee, uh, no, not the Pharisee, as the publican and the heathen, the person who doesn't believe, means we're heading forward, God forbid, separation, divorce. The last one is about everybody goes to their own place. God forbid that we don't reach that. But forgiveness is the goal. I need to forgive. Sometimes it takes some time to heal wounds that happen from hurt from uh, each other, but it does happen. Time will heal everything with God's grace. I am sure. God give us vitality of the body. And I look at it from this point of view. We have wounds, takes time and heals. Because there is vitality. God give us life. And also give us life 
to heal our emotional hurts. But also, we learn from that we don't hurt. I'm going to stop here. Any questions? Yes? So you talked about when your spouse, uh, مثلا, is angry and you... When your spouse is angry and you feel their feelings rather than being upset yourself and being the doormat. But at the same time, I think we should balance it by talking about boundaries and not accepting abuse. I don't think that's no, what Christ wants us. Yeah. That doesn't mean that this is, uh, I'm not talking about routine angers, you know, spells and routine that happens like almost like every day, every day, every day, we have to deal with it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna accept it just because that's the case. No, I'm accepting it because it's something, there must be something that's bothering me. Not because that's how he feels about me. And that means I'm, I'm not in his mind as equal or as uh, a person that he respects. That's all. There, there's, I'm not, this is not about to disrespect. It's about a normal medical relationship where there's love and respect. And we always going to talk about that love and respect mutually. We have to have love and respect mutually. But at, at one point or another, that person gets a little bit out of the normal, usual stuff and they go that, do that. And I'm not talking about uh, a pattern. Pattern has to be dealt with, of course. And pattern should have been foreseen before. I mean, that we don't come 10 years out, 20 years after marriage and we discover, oh, he's an abusive husband or an abusive wife. Where were we? Okay, should we stop here? Okay, uh, the last one we're going to do is about time management. And I think it's uh, something that I benefited from. How uh, every one of us struggles with time, especially today. And it will be a, a, from a book that I like a lot. And I did read it for the last 15 years, but I kind of remember the main items in it. And that's what I will give you, I'm not going to give you the details. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Have you read that? <coughs> Have you been through it? Anyone? <laughs> effective people. Highly I effective people. Uh, that, hmm? Have you read that book, anybody? My uh, son it's, was named to read it, or was asked to read it for a class in high school. I recommend it, big time. I'm going to give you the main items in it, and that, that would give you the, the, the biggest stuff, the bigger picture. But if you want, it's actually translated in all languages, including Arabic. Uh, that's that's a great book, recommended to everybody to read. It is more uh, how to think about your time. Something St. Paul had recommended. He said, redeem time, don't be ignorant. Redeem time means make the use of it, don't let it run from you. And as a family, how do you do that? You're very busy with work outside and inside. And it's a really, really important topic and I want us to be all uh, aware of this. Okay? Let's go have a break.